Uh, good afternoon. If I didn't have a chance to greet you this morning, if you weren't here uh, at yet, let me greet you now. And thank you for attending the uh, critical, seventh annual Critical Questions in Education Conference. And thank you for uh, attending this uh, keynote address featuring Mark Bauerlein from um, Emory University. You are sitting here. Um, there are a group of students sitting in Springfield, Missouri, my students. I don't know what they're doing. I know what they should be doing. Um, they should be writing a paper about Mark Bauerlein's The Dumbest Generation um, because they have it due in about a week. Um, because I had my teacher education students read it, um, which was has proven this is the second semester that I have had them read it, and it always proves a very interesting experience. Um, let me tell you about my Tuesday night class. We started off with Brave, I did something different this semester. We started off with Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. And then we mixed in some of Plato's Republic because I am convinced that Aldous Huxley was a very good reader of Plato's Republic. And, uh, and then I gave a test. Uh, I, and, uh, and at the same time that they were doing the take home part of the test, they were supposed to start reading um, The Dumbest Generation. So they came in one Tuesday night, and they were not pleased with me. I told my wife, I said, this is the point at which the honeymoon is over. You know, I've been a great guy up until then, but now I've given them, uh, now I've given them a test. And now I've uh, made them read a book that is going to challenge them. And they were a little grim with me when we started uh, discussing The Dumbest Generation, and the first hand up was uh, immediately dismissive of the entire argument, Mark. You were, she had read the first 50 pages and she was ready to dismiss the whole thing. Um, and the, the, it took a little while for the class to get going with it until one young man said something like the following. He said, uh, I took this book to my clinical placement, which was at Kickapoo High School, and he said, I was reading it while I was watching this class and waiting to teach my part of the lesson. And one of the students saw me reading the book, and he said, the student said, I'm one of the dumbest generation, aren't I? And, um, and my student said back to him, well, if Mark Bauerlein has it right, you are. But he said, so am I. And, uh, and I'm struggling with it, and I'm thinking about it, and here's a little bit what I know from my start on this book. Here's, here's what it, it seems to be about. Well, a high school student, objected to the whole thing, didn't like the sound of it, but my student started telling this high school student, you better take this seriously. You've got some thinking to do here. And, and um, so when my student then that next Tuesday night started saying this to my entire class, then they started listening. And they, of course, I could talk till I was blue in the face, but once a student started uh, uh, approving of the argument, being intrigued by it, seeing that it had some resonance, seeing that it was important, my class got behind the idea. And Mark, I'm happy to report to you that by the time we got done with the book, you had some, some supporters and some people that were taking your ideas very, very seriously. Mark has a second book out now, The Digital Divide. This is The Dumbest Generation and you, there have been copies of these sitting out on this table. Mark has been kind enough to um, make available uh, 10 or so copies of each book um, that he would be happy to sell to you for his cost for the unbelievably low price of $10 a piece, um, which is lots cheaper than you can get them at Barnes & Noble or Amazon.com. Plus, he'll sign them. So if you are interested in getting one of these books and having a signature put in it, um, we'll meet right over here when Mark is done with his remarks. But if you would please join me in welcoming and thanking Mark Bauerlein, Emory University, author of The Digital Divide and The Dumbest Generation. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for, for having me here. I, I've been
been here all day. I got in late last night, uh, but attending the sessions uh, all day and enjoyed them and, and been edified by them uh, as well and looking forward to tomorrow's uh, discussion as well. Uh, that, that title, The Dumbest Generation, uh, it, 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 it should be something that young people object to, obviously. And we want them to object to it, especially that, that sub subtitle, Don't Trust Anyone Under 30. Uh, I, I had a, a, a reporter from USA Today, she was 24, and she, she interviewed me, and her first question was, do you really believe that you can't trust anyone under 30? I said, well, look, look, this was before you were born, there was this slogan back, it's a joke, it's, it's a slogan back in the 60s, and so, you know, the boomers have grown up, so we, we, we've now turned it around. So I, I, I was letting her know uh, a little bit of the history of that. But uh, you, your students who respond first by dismissing uh, the thesis, uh, that's, that's not a bad response, right, as long as they follow it up. We want that stern voice that some of us take, the critical voice of the elders, to be not a dismissal of them, but a challenge and a provocation to them. And the best outcome for that experience is when the students argue back. Right? They are challenged to summon evidence to make arguments, to disprove those contentions. And I, I get a lot of emails from, from young people uh, I have and some uh, uh, call-in shows from the students. Some of them are, are, are pretty rough, some four-letter words, a few 12-letter words uh, in there as well. And I respond to everyone. Okay? One, if you're going to give this in your face, uh, provocation, you have to stand up and, and face the students, and you have to give them the chance to talk back. Two, more importantly, is you want to engage back and forth with them, and the ideal response is when the teacher, when I, have to send one email that says, you got me on that one. You're right on that point. I was wrong. You know, you, you make this challenge into a process whereby they actually disprove what you had contended, at least in their case, and that you should smile when you find yourself losing in this, in this challenge. And I'll, I'll get to the larger point about the necessity of there being some tension between older and younger generations, uh, a productive tension that I believe can happen uh, near the end. For now, uh, I'm gonna talk for about 30 minutes, 35 minutes longer, and then open it up for discussion and, and conversation. And we'll see, we'll see where that heads. Uh, but in the sessions that I've gone to, talking a lot about technology in the classroom, uh, about issues in schools, regarding some of the lesser forms of digital behavior. And again, I've, I've heard and learned a lot from those discussions, but I'm gonna talk about something elsewhere. Right? The digital technology outside of school. Digital technology in the leisure lives, the social lives of the young. And my hot title uh, goes into the strange social world of teenagers today. And uh, it is almost difficult to imagine how strange their social lives are if we do not place them in a larger historical time frame. That if we do not look back a hundred years ago and then fifty years ago and up to today, we don't see how unusual, in fact, how historically unique the social lives, the leisure lives of the average American 15-year-old is today. And here's where the uniqueness lies. 100 years ago, as, as we know, most people here know maybe more than I do about it, 100 years ago, the percentage 
of teenagers in the United States. High school age Americans who were in high school was at, you know, around, it was about 10% by 1910. But, but I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if 1895 it was four, less than that. But the point being that the vast, vast, vast majority of 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds were not in school. High school was not a normal place for them to go. Most Americans left school, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, basically whenever they learned to read and write, got some of the basic issues about American civics down, it was time to go. You had sufficient schooling to be a citizen in the United States. And where did they go? Well, they went to work on the family farm. They went to work in the family store. They went to work in the factories of child labor uh, during the progressive era. Uh, to work in the rail yards, to work in hotels, in restaurants, busboys, porters, and so on. Which meant that during those teenage years, they weren't teenagers. They were under the direct control and guidance of grown-ups. And they didn't have a social life. There wasn't something that you could identify as the social life of American teenagers. They would see each other, they might work together uh, here, here and there. They would see each other when after church, okay, at, at picnics, neighborhood gatherings, when there would be adults around. There just wasn't a great deal of independent leisure time to be populated with young adult teenagers with one another, okay? independent of the guidance or command or tutelage of grown-ups. Going to college, you know, 18, 19 year olds were down 1%. And in the 19th century, college was something exotic for most teenagers. If you read Moby Dick, one of the odd things about Captain Ahab in Moby Dick, people say that he's a college man. This is taken as something strange for him. We get an unrepresentative notion if we're looking at, you know, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, and you know Emily Dickinson, who, who did go to college for one year. They're unusual. Okay? It's different from what the average for most teenagers happen to be. Well, over the course of the, of the 20th century, you know, more and more teenagers went to high school. Okay? By the middle of the century, we're up 70, 80 percent. Of, of kids high school age are in high school. Okay. And what does this mean? It means that about 180, 185 days a year, and this is the, right, the age of the, the big high school, uh, they are spending seven or eight hours a day in a building, about a thousand of them, 1,500 of them, together in cities, smaller in, in, uh, in small towns. But they're in a building all day long and they are shuffled around, right, in groups of 25 or 30. They're, you know, by, by the 60s, they're, they're going, they, they've got lockers together, they have homeroom, they go to different classes, they eat together in the same room, more classes, they go to gym class, they shower together, they have then some after school extracurriculars, cheerleading, and sports, and band, and different clubs. And what does this mean? It means that suddenly they are spending more and more time in very concentrated spaces with one another. Okay. More than, well, almost half of their time is, is spent in school with each other and then after school for a few hours at least in extracurriculars or socializing. Okay. This is when you have social scientists and even media, Hollywood films, starting to look at adolescence as a discrete social formation. This is when peer pressure becomes a reality. There wasn't peer pressure in 1910. Right? Now there is something called peer pressure. You get movies like Rebel Without a Cause 
in which the you know the principal starts saying these kids today I, I don't understand them they seem different than we are and the culture industry discovers teenagers as a distinct group particularly a distinct distinct group that has money to spend in 1960 you know the great education uh, social scientist James Coleman with, with some of his colleagues publishes a book called great book the adolescent society where he actually says there is now something called adolescence that isn't just a time of life it has a discrete society of its own and he, he lays this out very clearly in, in polls and, and studies of different high schools where he says suddenly they have their own culture their own music they have their own dress, their own places to hang out that are demarcated as teen areas. Their own music, which is youth music. You know, today, if, if, uh, if, if 50, 60 year olds listen to the Beatles, in 1963, if you said, uh, if you're 55 years old, you say, I really like the Beatles. You were a little different. If you said in 1955, I love Elvis, and you were 60, you know, 20, a 20 year old would say, Oh, this is ours, not yours. I mean, go, go back a few decades earlier, in the mid 30s. If you're 17 years old and you say, I love Frank Sinatra, okay. If you're 45 years old and you say, I love Frank Sinatra, okay. There wasn't the distinction between adolescent society and adult society youth culture, adult culture. It set in when we started concentrating youths into these big you know, spaces and, and clustered them together. They formed their own society. And all the tribalisms and all the cliques and all the, the, the uh, nomenclature of high school socializing set in. Okay. Now, the thing is, even, even up through the 60s and 70s, there was a point at which, in each day, social life largely ended. Okay. And now you go home. You cross the threshold. You go home to have dinner. Now, there was one point of contact, the land, as it's now called, the landline. You know, usually one phone in the kitchen in, in my household in 1973. And there were a few kids who would talk on the phone for hours. Every once in a while you heard, oh, I, have a I have a telephone in my room now. That was a, a distinction that you would have. But you could only talk to one person. I mean, I, I think about going home and then saying, I'm going to call my friends whom I just saw you know, an hour earlier. I'm going to see them tomorrow. There was no social, well, there was little. TV was not a place for adolescents either at this time. Uh, I, I almost looked back uh, a while ago for a little little article. Uh, I looked at TV Guy, 1970, April, in Atlanta. Looked up the programming. So I come home at three o'clock, and what is on TV? And if you tell your students this, first of all, they'll go, you know, you'd be amazed. It's one, five channels. So that's it. Five stations. That's all, and you have to actually get up and turn the channel. You have to adjust the, the rapids. Use the word rabbit ears to your students. To see, see, see the rabbit, what rabbits have to do with it. Uh, but you say five channels, and it strikes them as just a, 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 an incredibly, incredibly impoverished cultural environment. That's all you've got. Okay, so three o'clock in the afternoon in Atlanta. I turn on the TV, and here's what I have another world. <laughs> on one station, The Secret Storm on another station, General Hospital on the other station. For those of you who remember, General Hospital, this is before the Luke and Laura era. Okay? <laughs> when when, when in college, I was in college in, in 1980, suddenly all my friends are watching Luke and Laura on General Hospital. God, but, and the, the, but that was a youth appeal, right? That's what, that's what suddenly struck. Suddenly college students, boys and girls, are watching. A soap opera, but for me, at, at, at you know, 12 years old, 13 years old, soap operas don't do it. On the other station was a talk show, it was either the Mike Douglas show or Merv Griffin, I can't remember which one. And then on the fourth, uh, the fifth station was Rocket Robin Hood, 
which is like a cartoon for, for six-year-olds. In other words, there was nothing that I could look at on the TV that reflected adolescence. Nothing that reflected my age group. There was only one, I looked for the rest of the day, there was only one show explicitly focused on teenagers. It was called the Patty Duke Show. Patty's in high school. And uh, she was opposite Walter Cronkite. <laughs> and, and so, uh, uh, when the whole family is there, you know, it's Walter Cronkite or Humphrey Brinkley, uh, Howard K. Smith, I think, was the ABC news. So, this is what would dominate, and if the TV was on in most stations, it, it would be the network news uh, that night. And a, lot, a lot of young people cannot understand the power of Walter Cronkite that he had over this country. The famous statement by Richard Nixon when Walter Cronkite finally signaled his objections to the Vietnam War. That's when Nixon said, we've lost. When Walter, when Walter, when Walter Cronkite came out. Uh, anyway, so I, you, you go home, you know, the TV isn't there. Social life had effectively ended. I thought about girls, I thought about sports, I thought about stuff going on in high school, but it was fairly dormant. Nothing could happen on a weeknight, really, that, that would change anything. Well, okay, let's move forward in time, where everyone's in high school, of uh, uh, high school age. Now, cable TV comes along in the early 80s, and one of the things cable TV does is find audience niches that aren't satisfied by the networks or by PBS. And one of them is recognizing an adolescent audience. Seeing that there is a big, giant consumer group here, and we can catch their eyes if we give them programming about themselves. And so suddenly, well now, if you go home at 3 o'clock, you can find adolescent-oriented programming with adolescents in it, or 30 year olds playing adolescents, right? 18, 17 year olds, uh, on, on well, some shows on Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon is kind of an early teen audience. TBS's after school programming, PBS after school uh, shows, the Disney Channel. You, know, you, you, you can find a dozen adolescent oriented affair, which means I've been with adolescents, people my own age group, all day long in school. I can go home now in 1989, 1990, and find several shows, often in a high school, with people my age in it, talking about my issues. This extends the social sense into the home in ways that hadn't existed before. Well, obviously you know where I'm going with this. We're in the digital age now. And what has the digital age done to the social lives of American teens. Well, they've extended it. It has extended it into every space and every minute of the day. Compare these situations. Uh, 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 you know, young junior, 14, 15 year old junior acts up in 1970. <coughs> Go to your room, you're grounded. And what does that mean? You go upstairs, you shut the door, you're going to be in isolation for a while so that you can reflect upon your misbehavior today. Go to your room, you're grounded. You, what do they do? The, 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 the teen goes upstairs, closes the door, and shuts out the rest of the house and opens up to the rest of the world because the laptop or the tablet is there, the Blackberry or the iPhone is there, the landline is there. The TV is there with youth programming on it, which means, and, and the bedroom is this, it's a social space. It's a social hub. It's a command center for youth to conduct their social life. And they can, again, open up to the outside world. And it doesn't stop. It's at midnight. In bed, you conduct a social life. When, when Pew Research, which does this continuing uh, internet and American life project, they did their, they often do studies of teens and, and digital media, teens and social media, or teens and cell phones. Last year, 
they were astounded to find, I can't remember the exact percentage, but to find the number of teenagers who sleep with a cell phone under the pillow in the on position. They want to be awakened at 2 in the morning if a text message comes through. They want to know what is happening. They want to be up to date. The social network is perpetually moving. When they turn it off, if they go to sleep and turn it off, they don't think, well, it stopped. No, it's still going on. There are text messages going back and forth. There could be photographs going back and forth. Something may be going up on my Facebook page. I may have emails coming through. It is a 24-7 activity, and anywhere they can sit in the back of their parents' uh, SUV uh, in the middle of Kansas on Route 70, not near any town, and conduct a social life. Okay. It extends everywhere and at all times. And again, even when they're logged off and disconnected, they're conscious of the activity going on. My students leave class, first thing they do, right, let's check, open up the cell phone, hit, hit, the, hit the screen, and see what has been going on for the last hour and a half when I have been out of touch. And look at the expression on their faces. It's not, hey, I wonder what wonderful things have been happening in my life. Well, let's see a little bit more. Oh, concern may be too strong a word, anxiety may be too strong a word, but they've been out of the network for an hour and a half. They don't know what is happening. They don't quite know where they stand. Is there a message that says, get over here, we're all meeting at Starbucks? I'm not there. I missed that meeting. You know, I feel left out. Or, you know, the, the most critical one from, from the loved one that says, I don't think we should go out anymore. Right? Breakups by text message, very common. Yeah. Which indicates the stakes of being up to date. The stakes of being connected. It is peer pressure, a long standing, nothing new about peer pressure. It's been around for 60 or 70 years and it's in its contemporary form. And I want to say that this came up in a, in a panel uh, just, just previously about sexting. The motivations behind this are, are nothing new. Teenagers have done terrible things, and friendly things, against and for one another forever. But these tools now have ramped up the activity. Okay. They have intensified the peer consciousness, the peer absorption. And if you ask them, as, as surveys have done, about these tools, we all know that these tools are fabulous miraculous things. Look at what the tools, look at what digital technology has done in areas of medicine, in science, in, in, in education, in access, right? in sharing. Okay? And we are living in a remarkable age because of that. Never has so much knowledge and information, history, literature, art, politics, geography, foreign affairs, never has been so much available and accessible to young people. It is a window onto the universe of known things. But again, we're operating with teenagers with one of the most powerful forces on Earth, and that is the peer absorption, peer pressure, peer absorption and their own feelings about their friends. Their own fragile egos, which look toward their own age group for support and security, which suffer terrible anxiety about what can happen in high school. Is there anything worse for a 17-year-old to be shunned by other 17-year-olds? Those are the stakes. For them. And so what these tools mean for them is a great big window onto one another. 
a place in which to make contact with one another. And again, in polls, when they ask teenagers about cell phones, what are they for? The vast majority of them say the primary reason is to keep up with friends. It is for social contact. It could be intellectual growth. It could be civic behavior. Of course, that's, that, that's the potential. And we all see that that can happen with these tools. But the challenge is to try to steer some of those adolescent interests, those adolescent fixations with these tools over into more intellectual activity. That is, is a new challenge. We didn't really have to face this uh, before. I mean, we always had peer pressure. It wasn't so pervasive. We didn't have this arsenal. And it made adult pressure easier to exert on the young. If the TV was on in 1974, as it was in my household, uh, you know, over dinner or, or after dinner, it was on to something that I didn't want to hear about. And I didn't want to talk to my, I didn't want to listen to my parents complain about Watergate and Nixon. Uh, I, I wasn't interested in, in their world, in their interests. And I, I, I didn't want to hear, I didn't like them okay, at the time. But I couldn't check out. I couldn't sit at the dinner table and, and go like this. I couldn't turn the channel. I couldn't go upstairs to my room. We didn't have a TV. I only have one, one television. And so it was on to Walter Cronkite. So there was a greater presence of again, adult matters in, in my household. And again, when I was 15, I was no better than any other 15 year olds today. And I wouldn't have been immune to the temptation to go upstairs and get on a blog about high school that are showing some, some, some pictures from the party the week before. I would have done that as well, but I didn't have the tools to, to do that, to go with my own sense of peer pressure and, and adolescence. Well, now that there is that, there is that uh, capacity that all young people possess at this point. And this means that the proper balance in leisure out of school life between peer pressure and adult pressure is out of whack. <clears throat> I mean, peer pressure limited is, is not really a bad thing. Students need to socialize with one another in order to develop good social habits, to know how to deal with you know, equals rather than just receiving instruction from above from parents that that socialization process is important, but it has to be, again, counterbalanced by adult pressure, by grown-ups saying to 17-year-olds that there are bigger worlds than high school. There are more important heroes than, than you know, the heroes of, of high school social life, that there are more significant triumphs, that the things that are going to make you popular with your friends at age 17 aren't really going to work when you're 30 years old. In fact, the things that might impress others when you're 30 could even cast you as weird or a nerd or, or, or you know, make you feel like an outcast when you are 17. <clears throat> so that what I, that's what I mean when I refer to the tension between the generations as actually a healthy thing. That it is now ever more so the responsibility of grown-ups to, at times, these are often judgment calls, offer that stern rebuke of adolescence for being adolescent which is their natural condition. That, you know, people say, say to me, oh look, old people have always been complaining about young people. Come on, uh, this is, we've heard this before. And on my response, yes, and that's what we should do now and then. 
That's one of our responsibilities as elders to rebuke the juniors for you know, their self-involvement or their, their, their peer absorption or their adolescence, once again. And it is a healthy thing for the adolescents to resent it and argue back and saying, you, you know, you're getting a little bit too narrow-minded, a little too rigid, and there are a lot of things new in the world that you don't sufficiently appreciate. Again, that's, I think, a productive tension between the old and the young. It's what we saw in the youth movement of the 1960s. Okay? We idealized SDS and, and, and other, uh, the free speech movement, uh, and, and I think there are some reasons to idealize it, uh, and one reason was that the youth at that, that time, uh, Tom Hayden, Todd Gittin, other leaders of the student movement, they couldn't stop thinking about the elders. They couldn't stop talking about the establishment. They couldn't stop criticizing the world their parents made. Well, you know, we might say a lot of their, their positions and criticisms were just, again, adolescent hubris. On the other hand, they were engaged, and they were coming up with reasoned arguments about the world. Okay? They were critically engaged, and a lot of elders were critically engaged with the youth movement as well. The bad thing is when the generations start ignoring each other. Okay? When the youths don't resent their parents, they don't criticize the existing world, the world that their parents are delivering and, then, and other elder authorities are delivering over to them, it's when they just kind of dismiss them. They just shrug it off and go back to their own social worlds. This is, this is a, a formula for, again, complacency. And when the elders just say, oh, well, kids will be kids, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll grow up at, at some point. And what I say is shirking their responsibility to be mentors and tutors to the young, which sometimes means arguing, which sometimes means chastising. But that that challenge is ever more necessary today precisely because social life is so strong for young people. 3,339 text messages per month sent or received on average, for teenagers with cell phones. That's according to Nielsen Media. Okay. More than 100 text messages a day. About 250 phone calls a day over cell phones. Add in the Facebook time. Add in the email and the instant messaging and, and, and the Twitter, other forms of contact uh, that go with it. Add in the TV watching time, which is still the two and a half to three hours per day for teenagers, most of it consumption of teen fare, uh, add in the youth music, add in the web browsing, going to websites, which again deliver adolescent fare to them. And, and you're looking at a tidal wave of digital media, which is about adolescents entering into their lives, which puts greater pressure again, on us the mentors, the teachers, the grown-ups, to exercise more influence, to try to pull them out of their horizontal network and into an engagement, sometimes a critical engagement, with adults. That is, is the challenge, uh, how to do it, how to, how to intervene in the social network, but without, without estranging them. It doesn't mean there is a tension, but don't make it a withdrawal, okay. mutual withdrawal from, from one another. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and, and leave it open for, I think I've gone about 35, 40 minutes, and leave it open for, for questions, <coughs> comments, and, uh, and some, some deliberation. So I'm, I'm not sure. The, the floor is open. Just raise your hand. I would ask you to capsulize your question as, as carefully as you can, but. Uh, who wants to go first? Did 
you get a chance to read the article in the National Geographic about the brain research they just come out with adolescents where they're looking at, they scan the brain and looking at specifically the, my, the, the layer of myelin that, that is between the neurons, that it thickens between the ages of 15 and 25, meaning that they're not able to recall things as efficiently as we as adults. The other part of that was that starting from the back of the brain, where we make decisions between risking something <coughs> and, and reward. And with a teenager, when and they use the game philosophy, I think it has to do with what you're talking about, where a kid will play a game and if you stop if you go through a yellow light and make it great, if you don't, then you if you if you, you, you kill, you get killed. And so when they're alone, they'll they'll stop. When they're with peers, they'll risk it. <coughs> and so what the study showed is that technically they value risk a lot more than reward. You, you know, you know, that's, I haven't seen the National Geographic article, but I, I have uh, uh, looked at some of the, the brain research, and one, one of the contributors in, in this uh, digital divide is a guy named Gary Small, who with Gigi Morgan wrote a book called I Brain: How to Survive, and he, he's actually a, an important brain researcher at UCLA. He's done a lot of scanning and done work with uh, Alzheimer's, uh, but he, he's done work looking now at that. Uh, youths and doing brain scans of people while they're online and he's formed some experiments and one thing that he and others actually have come about is yeah youths are not very good 18 year olds aren't good at risk assessment right. okay? they, they don't think of, of longer term consequences which I explains some things uh, such as you know what we were talking about earlier today in one panel why would these people post pictures of themselves mm -hmm. online that might seem fun, but they're there. And they're gonna be there for a long time. When you go for a job now, employers routinely now, in human resources, before they hire, just, just, just type in a name into Google. And you look at the Facebook page, you look at the, the, the Google results. And one, 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 uh, one person who, who does hiring for the military in, in areas of logistics, he says, we throw out 30% of applications in 10 seconds. I mean, you see a picture, you know, like this, losing it up at a party. We all did this when we were young, but now, well, that, that one's out. We just don't want the, the complication uh, there. And also the sense of why are you keeping these pictures of yourself on your Facebook page when you're applying for jobs? Think, think. So the risk assessment is, is, is certainly an issue. Um, Another thing is the empathy issue. I mean, in brain studies, the empathy issue, teenagers uh, do not often have the capacity to understand the impact of their actions on others. They just don't have the imagination to put themselves in the position of a recipient. Now, this has always been the case but now it's more of a problem because these tools allow teenagers to do things to one another much more than they did before. And they wanted to, but they have an arsenal of affecting one another in ways that they didn't before. You might take a, an indiscreet Polaroid picture and you could pass it to someone and show it looked like now you take a picture and you can email it to the 